My name is Mary Catherine Froelich, and I'm your host for Books and Brews. I want to thank Matt and Martin for making all the sound happen. Let's give them a hand. And Pale Fire, I feel like I'm excited because this is five times in a row, in person, live. I just keep giving thanks for that after the last few years. So that's exciting. Thank you all for coming out. This is a community conversation. So you will get an opportunity to ask questions, share your stories about midway through. So start thinking about those. Um, as Matt said, uh, January, just after the biggest consumer-based experience of the, of the year, we we're all feeling it in January. So I'm excited to introduce Jennifer Howard. Um, she is a writer and journalist. She's a former contributing editor for the Washington Post Book World and former senior reporter for Chronicle of Higher Education, where she covered the humanities, technology, publishing, and libraries. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Times Literary Supplement, Los Angeles Review of Books, Slate, V, I always say this wrong, VQR, too many, there, the anthology DC Noir, and elsewhere. She came down from Washington, D.C. tonight, big journey, <laughs> where she lives with her family and is joining us tonight to talk about her book, Clutter, An Untidy History. Let's give Jennifer a warm welcome. Thank you, MK. How's the sound? Can everybody hear? Sound Excellent. check. We're good. Excellent. First of all, I just want to say congratulations for going into such an in-depth book, really meticulous research on clutter and how we got here, your own personal experience of it, and then the book print is so tiny. <laughs> <laughs> so that's huge. <laughs> we have to uh, talk to my talk to my publisher about that. But I originally envisioned the book um, being a whole lot longer, and my editor said to me, "You do not want to turn the book into clutter. You really." <laughs> so I think he was right. <laughs> well, you so often see that in talking about clutter that we're, we produce it. So yes. I I think that's a first kudo right there. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, in your prologue, in that scene where you first start us off, you're walking into your mother's house, and it's it's a disaster. I mean, it it I mean, from bags the way you describe it, bags piled up, um, mouse feces, um, litter, clothes piled, just just yeah. a disaster everywhere. And I just wondered. You know, was that something, was your mother, an accum did she have a problem with accumulation all of her life? No, it really, it, it came as a shock to me that things got as bad as they did in the last couple of years, several years of her life, um, or, or her, her living in her house. When I was growing up, she certainly, you know, we had a comfortable house. It was not, it, she was not a minimalist, um, but she was not out of control as far as I could tell. You know, I wasn't growing growing up in squalor. Um, there certainly weren't mouse carcasses and the kinds of things I found when I went to have to deal with the house many years later. So it was something that kind of crept in over her life, and particularly in the last decade or so, as she confronted other struggles, um, mm -hmm. both uh, physical, psychological, um, and then material challenges, which we can go into more. But it was really, um, yeah, it, the, the house really became became. Uh, horrible situation both for her and for anybody who tried to had to, to try to you know, help exactly which she wouldn't let anyone do really so mm -hmm. yeah you kind of mentioned that you had some idea or some you know it's kind of a working theory of how it began is you want to share that with us or oh with my mother's um mm -hmm. situation yeah so my mother um was a very creative person she was uh, an artist a musician uh, painter, she loved to cook, she loved to garden, so she was you know, very creative and there was always a little bit of creative chaos maybe in her life, um, which was great until it wasn't great. She grew up in, um, in Worcester, Massachusetts, um, a really a, a working class family um, without a lot of stuff. And I remember her when I was um, younger, she would tell me about having looking at the rich girls in town and all the things, the nice things they had and really wishing she could have nice shoes and nice purses and things. And her family, I think they bought one pair of shoes per kid per year. 
was that kind of situation. Um, and so as she got older and, and became an adult, she started to acquire more things and I think fell into that trap that a lot of people in this um, kind of consumer culture fall into of more is better, right? You don't need you know, one pair of shoes, two, three, five, 10, 15. I don't remember how many boxes I pulled out of her closets, but it was it was sort of it was approaching a Melda Marcos level. Um, so, and I think I think she really with her with her and she loved beautiful things. She really appreciated a lot of the nice things in life, and that also it kind of trapped her. Um, and then of course the, the, what really capped it was um, dementia cre creeping in over a long period of, of years, which made it much harder increasingly for her to manage anything including all the stuff that she had acquired, so, yeah. Oh, I just want to read, it's a short line you, you put here. As, after you talked about what you walked into and you said, this is how my mother has been living and it has almost killed her. And now it is my problem to deal with. I mean, yeah. how did that feel to, to have that passed on to you of having to sift through this? It's it it was it was really a shock. I mean, it, even though I we knew that she was developing that, that she was having trouble managing, um, we, you know that was it was pretty clear. But she would never allow us to help beyond just taking out a bag of trash or two. Um, and actually, the day that that, that um, we we went over, we find my husband and I said we need to do something about this. We need to go and t it, it is not safe for her to be in this. I mean, it's you know there are just stacks and stacks of rotting uh, food boxes or takeout boxes with rotting food and all. And she's she's having falls. She can't do laundry. It was really we knew that, that something really had to be done. But I didn't think I thought we'd have a tough conversation and something it'd be an argument and then we could maybe get her some help or figure out what to do. But instead we went over and she was just, you know, almost comatose. She just had had a complete collapse and went to the hospital, then to rehab and never was able to come back home. So suddenly, I mean, literally overnight, all of this was my problem. I was not prepared. I just, I mean, I was shocked. I knew she had a lot of stuff and that she, it was a struggle for her, but it wasn't until I really started looking at all these, you know, going through the rooms and looking at all this stuff that I realized the depth of it. And I was completely overwhelmed. Um, I was, this was, um, you know, I had, my, I had a full-time job, two kids. Um, my daughter and son were 10 and 12. Um, at the time, I had my own household to run. I'm an only child. My stepfather was dead; had already been dead several years. So suddenly, I had to figure out what to do on at every level. I mean, from the mouse carcasses to the the financial you know arrangements and all of this stuff. Um, meanwhile, trying to manage her medical care and figure out what she needed. And it was, I was just overwhelmed. I was not prepared. Um, and then I was angry after that. I mean, <laughs> honestly, that I have to, it doesn't sound nice, I know, but I, I was really angry that I had been thrust into the situation, angry at her, angry at, uh, then, then I, I mean, the anger then kind of moved on toward maybe larger systemic forces. But it's like, how does this happen? You know, how does somebody end up in this kind of thing? And what am I going to do about it? Because this is not something, you know, that really life, unless you, go through it or have conversations ahead of time, you're not necessarily prepared. I certainly wasn't. <laughs> yeah. And I, if it feels like because of the way you've laid this book out and looking at not just your own experience and being very willing to share that experience, which is appreciated, um, but also looking deeper into how we got into this. How, how did we get into getting so many things, not being able to let them go, and then just becoming overwhelmed with emotion of the things as well. And you even bring up a point, the physical nature of the things overwhelming us, is what did you discover about how we're treating this disorder yeah. of hoarding? Yeah, and I, you know, I'll never know whether my mother would actually be diagnosed as a, with hoarding disorder, which is now a recognizable, recognized psychiatric um, uh, disorder. But she certainly had serious issues with it, and there are different ways of measuring, you know, this. Um, what I quickly discovered, I mean, I, when this happened, I was, as I said, I was shocked, and I felt so alone in this that I thought. I was so embarrassed and just overwhelmed and, and angry about it. But as soon as I started talking to people about it, um, I remember standing in my office kitchen at the time, telling a co sort of unburdening myself to a coworker who was maybe about my age. And she started telling me about her family house. Her parents had taken to just stuffing all the mail in trash bags and putting it in the attic and never dealing with it. 
and the whole. And then another coworker walked in and, and overheard us talking and started telling us about his mother's house, which he was dreading having to clean out because she was having some, you know, just overwhelmed with stuff too. And the more people I talked to, the more kinds of similar, I mean, every story is unique, every situation and person is unique, but there are a lot of commonalities. And that led me to wonder, as, you know, as a reporter, I ask questions and I wanna know what this, what, why, why things happen. So I started looking into you know, how, how common this was, what were the mental health aspects, what are the other, you know, what other contributing factors were there. Um, and that led me down this road of, of reporting, talking to all kinds of people and trying to put together some larger picture of the, the kinds of forces that trap my mother and trap a lot of people. When you mentioned shame, and I, I had a, a person come up to me this weekend at a conference and said her husband was a hoarder and he was right there and he kind of shirt smiling and and I said, but no, because you you mentioned there are other ways to call this. What are the other names? Oh, and I, I, I shared that with them and it lightened things, you know, it yeah. kind of took us away. But what were some of those names that you discovered? Yeah. Well, I mean, hoarder is not, hoarder is, a, is, is an insult, basically. It equates the person with the situation or the problem. But I went to a conference where, where I heard some people who, who suffered from hoarding disorder talk about what they do. And I mean, sometimes they call themselves artists or finder keepers, I thought was a fascinating phrase. Um, you find it and you keep it. <laughs> and, and, um, it so they're, they're, there's not, they, they don't always... I think they know that it's not something that the world looks kindly on, but it may feel very different than it looks. And that that made me realize that people come to clutter in many different ways and live with it in many different ways. And I, I don't think there's necessarily a bright line between being a hoarder and being a curator or a collector. You know, there's some, there are ways of maybe knowing when you've gone too far, but it's a, it's a really complex set of issues. And it's always important to remember that the person the problem is not the person. I mean, the person has value and worth and, and beyond whatever uh, situation you know they're struggling with, and that that was really important to me to kind of carry with me through this. Right, and a little different approach than the hoarding reality TV show, really, for intervention. Yes. Or are there other methods beyond just going out and cleaning them out? It's, I mean, that, what happens then, if you do a forced clean out, you're inflicting more trauma on somebody who is probably already struggling and traumatized. Um, I talked to a, a, a licensed social worker who's, who um, said that basically, if you go in and do a forced clean out, you might as well, it, it's the equivalent psychological damage of a hurricane or a fire or a flood. Just to come in and have somebody's stuff wiped out, basically their life wiped out, um, it, it's not gonna help. It, it's gonna make them make it harder for them. It's not gonna solve the problem and it's just gonna make it, give them more things to be, you know, to, to struggle with. Um, and I thought that was, so the hoarding, the hoarding shows, they're, they're fast, I've watched too many hours of them, but they're, they're all about shame and guilt and all this, and it's such an unkind way to approach people who are really suffering um, and to make a spectacle out of it, you know, is, is really, which I, uh, I, it's not, it's not a good, it's not a good way to, to handle this, this problem. Yeah. So how long, since you did dive in yeah. into the research and the details, how long have we really been in this age of conspicuous consumption? Gosh, I mean, I, I never found a start, an origin point for clutter, like a day zero, you know. <laughs> but I did. I was surprised to how far back this kind of excess, the, the idea of excess goes. And it's not, you know, I focus mostly on American and European culture because that's what I know, and that's sort of where, where my family history is. Um, but all over the, you know, not all over the world. In, in many parts of the world, there are there are certainly there's a tradition of of. Uh, display and get too much, you know, maybe, maybe too much stuff. Um, but I, I, the farther back I looked, I mean, I, you know, back to certainly the, you know, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, and then really in the Victorian era, the 19th century was when I started to feel like I see things in that era that remind me so much of what I see now and what, what kinds of forces that my mother was working against. Cool. Not working against it's the case with me. What's that? No. Uh, uh, oh, not working against Yeah, it. yeah. Yeah, it was um, the, the souvenir you talked about, sort of mm. that same 
going after and, and the, the different authors who you quoted who talked about Chotsky's basically, you yeah, know, yeah. that they had them on these shelves. That, that was a, one of the prevailing aesthetics then uh, was that like you don't just put one picture on the wall, you have a whole wall full of pictures, you have very heavy stuffed furniture, you know, the kind of masterpiece theater, 19th century interiors. Um, there's some some truth to that. And that and the uh, the idea of um, you have mass produced goods, the Industrial Revolution, you know, empires, a lot of global trade. So there's more stuff coming in, more people maybe with, with who live in cities and can see things that they can buy. And I just felt like that's when I saw when I really felt the the, the forces of consumerism kicking in. And then if you trace it a little further, you get, you know, the, um, once you get mass advertising, early 20th century radio, and then television, and then the World War One and the, the reaction of the kind of, it's patriotic to spend, you know, we, we need to, re, to uh, get the domestic economy, the, the peacetime economy back up and running. Um, so I just thought I could just see these, the, these forces building and building and building. It was fascinating to me to see the through lines uh, from what had seemed to me like a very isolating personal situation. It was rampant, it sounds like. Well, and, and now we've added the shop till you drop kind of <laughs> mottos yep. or you need to buy in bulk um, or even get it the next day on Amazon Prime. I mean, how has that shaped sort of how you look at the individual responsibility towards this consumerism and this yeah. recycling and mass production of things? I mean, are we responsible for this? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I certainly feel like everybody has, an, I believe in individual responsibility for sure, but it's very hard for individuals to, to fight against these, these, um, well, to Instagram, I like Instagram, I like to go on Instagram, and um, if I look, if I make the mistake of clicking on any ad, even though I think I've got ad blockers and things, I'll have Googled swimsuits or footwear or something, and suddenly my feed uh, on every platform is just filled with all these ads, and, and I start to think, well, maybe I should, maybe I should just buy it, you know, I could buy it, I could have I, they keep. They want. They want me to buy it. I should buy it, and it takes a lot of willpower, <laughs> and just even. And they're so. They're, they're. You know. It just. There's. It's so. It's not subtle, but it's persistent. And, and even though. I, and I, it's. It's very hard to to disable all that. And I, I do try with the ad blockers and things to minimize my, you know, my exposure. But it never seems to really work. My filters are never good enough. Um, and we're just surrounded by this all day long. If it's online, you know, there's always a pop-up ad or something. And uh, plus you see what other people, the people in your life or people you don't know, what they're buying, what they're wearing. It looks nice. It's easy. You click. Your, your credit card information is stored half the time. One click, you know, and it's at... Uh, during the pandemic, it was great in some ways. Amazon Prime, you know, if you ran out of something, you could have it on your, on your front porch maybe the same day. And that's... And without having to go to the store and put yourself at risk and whatever, but it's too easy. It's so easy, and it's easy to the purchases add up, the stuff adds up, um, and and also when you do go back to store. Now that we're going back to stores, I I went to Staples recently and just trying to I, I wanted to find one thick black sharpie, just one. I, just one. <laughs> I mean, I go through one like every three years. And I, I found a pack of 10 and then a pack of four. So now I have a red, green, blue, and black. I never will use the red, green, or the blue. But I, I needed the one Sharpie and now I have four. You know, And it's just, you, there's so many examples like that. You think of a box of, of paper clips. How many you go through and you've got 10 suddenly, 10 boxes mm -hmm. for your life. That's right. <laughs> and people after you. <laughs> yeah. I, I was, when I was reading that section on the, you know, the really looking at online and I was thinking of the online registries, you know, where now these registries for the, the bridal and the, the baby showers and things, and yeah. there, there's no limit because you're not in a store anymore. It's an online registry. So it's just overwhelming yeah and you had a quote in here from uh i think it's let me just pull it up elizabeth chin mm. sort of talking about mm -hmm. in her book my life with things um that the ritual gift of that first tough toy is also the first step in training individuals to put their trust in things not people chen writes it's really quite a strange practice 
It, it is. I mean, I, I still have my chi a couple of my childhood loveys, and they are they are wonderful. But but every child I know, you know, like all my kids uh, and their generation, I'm, bags and bags and bags of stuffed animals, and and because they're 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 cute, you know. Who doesn't love the little, you know, the beanie baby, or whatever? It just it's. But you, a kid can only have can only use so many, and uh, it just. Yeah, it's all, it's too much. I it, wonder, are we setting them up for being overwhelmed at the get-go, not only the kids, but parents who are having to clean up behind it, you know? Yes, exactly. One of my great parenting failures was uh, I never managed to devise a system to contain my son's Legos. I tried, and I tried, and I tried. <laughs> And there was a, <laughs> Leela's, my daughter's in the audience, she's laughing because uh, she probably remembers. Gross. Yeah. So <laughs> and I was like, no, you know, more minifigures. Every, the grandparents for a number of years would send a, a Lego set or some kind of Lego thing. And they were great and they were fun and creative, but there's so many and you can't build it, but so many times, you know, and then trying to contain them without puncturing your feet, you know, because they always get scattered on the floor and you walk on them. And anyway, it, it is a lot. It's, it's, <laughs> And I know, I know not everybody has that kind of abundance, but a lot of people in this in this uh, society do, or even if it doesn't feel like we're rich, but we, st we certainly are often rich in things. You know? Right. And I wonder if, if we can learn how to gift differently. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if there's probably, there are probably similar groups here, but I have really been encouraged in Washington by the rise of the Buy Nothing groups and Facebook groups like, um, the parent parents who will swap toys or gear, and it's great because it really makes it much cheaper to to raise a family, which as we know is not cheap to do, and it also means it keeps it means that you don't have to keep buying new stuff. Um, that that a stroller can be perfectly good, you know, for two or three kids, it's fine. Um, and stuff leaves. It yes, exactly. It, it it's out leaves. of your house. It's out of your house, so your children will not have to clean it up down the road. Yeah. When when you were looking at um, sort of how how we've tidied up for a long time, we've had a lot of experts who come around mm -hmm. um, since the Victorian age and before. It sounds like, or they found a place for everything. Are there systems that work in helping us organize our stuff and live life more meaningfully? Gosh, if if I had a great answer to that question, I would be very rich. And um, <laughs> I don't. I th what I've come to conclude is that there are systems that can help. But you have to figure out what is going to help you. And there's no one, one size fits all. Um, but there is a lot to choose from. But even something like Marie Kondo, I'm actually a fan. I don't do the whole, you know, minimal, not, not of the fully, not that of the full system necessarily, but, but her kind of humane approach to keeping what sparks joy, I think is a really nice metric you can adapt for yourself. It doesn't mean you have to only have, you know, one shelf of books or, or three t-shirts, but you know, you have your own standard of how much is enough and what's meaningful. Um, some people, there, so there are more systems and gurus than, than yeah, there are stars in the sky practically. There's probably something out there that would help. Um, there's some good podcasts, you know, occasionally I'll, I recently, I listened to one last week. I don't remember the organizer's name, but she said, she said, your clutter is trying to speak to you. Listen to what it's trying to tell you. And I thought that was an interesting way of, like, what's the problem in your life that, or the, the stumbling block or the hurdle or the, uh, the dream that you're holding on to that for. So, yeah. So no, no easy answer. How about Swedish death cleaning? Oh. <laughs> that's that's a fun. Fans here. Oh yeah, yeah. That, I think that's a delightful book. I really appreciated appreciate that book. Um, I, I just are other people familiar with this book? The 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 gentle art of Swedish death cleaning, um, and it's by a Swedish woman, Margareta Magnusson, I want to say, who basically talks about she she writes the book in her later years as she is going through. Uh, um, her stuff and thinking about what her children are going to want, what they're not more likely, what they're not going to want. And uh, to hear her tell it anyway, it's a fairly common thing in Swedish culture where you do a, you do your own clean out. You know, you clean up, you, you go, you look at what's in the tool shed or in the whatever the utility closet, and you deal with it. And she's really frank about saying, you know, you know, if you don't deal with it, someone else is going to have to, and you, they're not necessarily going to want your stuff. You should just just because it's yours doesn't mean it's you know. It's valuable to you. It's not necessarily going to be valuable to other people, um, but she's good humored about it too. It's not. It's not a depressing book, so, and it's short. 
Yeah, and I, I read that you had friends in D.C. who did a downsizing party. Yes, I thought that was so interesting. Um, there, there's neighbors of mine who spent their careers in the Foreign Service, which meant that they uh, they you know lived all over the world, collected a lot of interesting things, um, art and so forth, and just memorabilia, and then came back to Capitol Hill and needed to downsize. So they threw a downsizing party, and they invited people to come and take an item if they saw something they liked, that you they could they would they could take the item and then the the host would tell a story about it. You know, like this is where we got this from. And it's a, and I thought it was a lovely way to kind of honor the things, but also be free of them and know that they were going to homes that might at least carry a little bit of that history forward. Did did any of these processes work for you in getting rid of <laughs> I, I, still a work in, in progress in the research or or things that, that were brought more satisfaction than others as far as when oh. you were sifting and getting rid of things yeah you know what i found most satisfied well with my mother's things once i got past being shocked and overwhelmed and angry i started to find meaning in finding homes for them if there was anything that could be useful to somebody else and i could make that match um, that was really that ended up being meaningful somebody said to me well why don't you just get a dumpster and put all the stuff in it and i'm like I can't do that. This is this is my mo my mother's life. This is my family history. I don't know what's in here, and I can't just you know a lot of this stuff could be useful. Um, it did it did take a whole lot of effort. Which and and if you've ever tried to give things away, that you know sometimes there are just too many books or records or whatever. You no, know, some you might not be able to find homes. Um, I was able to find some interesting homes for for things. Um, the most unusual item I had to rehome was a harpsichord. My mother was a classically trained keyboardist, which is one of my favorite things about her. And uh, so I, I, she had this enormous harpsichord, which I can't play, and I live in a row house, couldn't put it in there. But I found a music student in Baltimore who, who needed an instrument, and she gave it, gave the harpsichord a home for actually a number of years, and we, we just finally found someone who wanted to buy it. But I really, that, that meant a lot to me because my mother had actually painted the soundboard herself with wildflowers and, and insects and things. It was a really lovely, you know, if it had been a violin, I would have kept it. Um, but a harpsichord just uh, is too big uh, for, for if you don't play it. But instruments need to be played. And I know my mother would have enjoyed, I think she would have appreciated that it went to someone who needed an instrument and would play it. So... Um, and then I took the uh, smaller things like um, bags of uh, office supplies, went to the animal shelter because mom loved animals and the animal shelter needs all those paper clips and, and extra Sharpies too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it did take a lot of effort. It took, it took me two years to, uh, total. It, and I was also working full time and raising kids and all, but, but it took it that long in part because there was a lot of stuff, but also because I wanted to try as best I could to you know, find good homes. Some of it ended up having to be trashed, but um, I, I think I did a pretty good job. Yeah. You you have a section in here. It's a, a voice memo where you're sitting at your <clears throat> mother's desk, and you then recite all the things that are in that. It's just a a lovely page and a half of things discoveries in your mother's desk. But I'm going to open it up here for questions, um, stories from our audience. The question is for people who amass so much, what part does the obsessive compulsive behavior play in that? Well, I have to preface that by this by saying I'm not a, a psych psychotherapist or a trained mental health professional. Um, for a long time, the, uh, the APA, the American Psychological Association, considered hoarding disorder a subset of OCD. That changed in 2013 when they, when they made it its own category. Um, suggesting that it's not necessarily an OCD off, offset. But I think there's so many different reasons that people get get too much stuff. Um, and I, I imagine for some people, OCD might be a, play a role. I, in interviewing people, I, it seemed the people, and this is anecdata, it's not, a, not statistical at all, but my impression was that OCD tended to drive people a bit in the opposite direction, that they were perhaps more likely to really try to keep a clutter-free home, but that is a wild generalization. It's not, not based on anything other than conversations. So. So. Thank you for that. What, what, what is the relationship between having too much stuff and filth, um, having groceries that are not put away and things like yeah. that? 
Yeah, well, well, first I want to say that thank you for sharing your experience of your childhood. That, that sounds like it was really tough. Um, you can be loved and still still have a really hard situation, obviously. And that, that is one thing I think it's important to point to, to remember is that clutter does not just affect the person who has it. It affects people, anybody who's intersecting with their lives, particularly their loved ones, um, children, um, parents, spouses, or partners, pets. Um, one, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of collateral damage uh, in, in that. Anyway, so it's important to remember that clutter can be, a, you know, can, can really be damaging to, to those who, who are not the direct causes of it. Um, so I'm sorry you had to go through that. I think, um, I don't know, there, there is such a, if, if you love a certain kind of thing, records or books or something, it's not wrong to have a lot of them. I mean, they, they help define you and they help, you know, they're meaningful to you. They're one of your values. They express one of your values. Um, if it gets too far, obviously, I don't know where one begin, where a lot of stuff en ends and clutter really begins, but it's, if, it, if it starts to really interfere with your life, with living a, a healthy, safe life, a happy life, the kind of life you want to live, then I think it's crossed that, uh, that line into um, something that's really not healthy. And that's, um, that it's a tough thing sometimes for people who are living that, through that process to see when they've gone from just having a lot of stuff to being, you know, but there are, there are red flags if, if you can't keep up with household chores. Law, in my mother's case, she was really it was hard for her to clean, cook, do laundry. I discovered she had just been throwing dirty clothes down the basement stairs, and uh, and there was a mountain. I had to climb over this mountain of stuff, and that had never she had never let she would never have done that earlier. Um, so, and she stopped having people into her home, did she? Her yes, friends. Yes, very much. She used to like to give dinner parties. It was never it wasn't a big house, but she'd have people over for dinner. She loved to cook, and for several years that was not. Um, not happening, and she she stopped having people into the house. So I think I think she knew. What happens when it's What happens when it's and she yeah. addresses that in the book when it's a health or a sanitation problem. Yeah, I, I discovered too late that you there are there are agencies and people you can call if you are really seriously concerned that somebody is putting themselves or you know living in a way that's dangerous. Um, it's a, from personal experience, I can tell you it's a really tough conversation to have. At, and I never was successful with my mother in getting her to accept help or have somebody come in. I, had, I did, I, one, of the, one of my favorite interviews for the book was with a Philadelphia fire department captain whose, um, whose mother actually had suffered from hoarding disorder. So he had personal experience with it. Oh, and he actually had OCD. He, um, I don't, he, which he felt gave him a, some, some, made him more sympathetic and maybe able, able to deal with it, talk to people in a humane way. But what he would do, he would, they call it heavy contents in the, the fire department of Philadelphia, if it's, a, if it's a hoarding situation, heavy contents is the code word for the firefighters. To, Cause it's, you know, you can't get in, if you can't get into the house safely with all your firefighting gear and all, you need to know. Anyway, but he, yeah, it was really fascinating. He, um, but he, he, he had some success going into people's houses and saying, my job is to keep you safe. My my team needs to be able to get in here and give you CPR or get you out if there's a fire. Philadelphia City Fire Code requires, I don't remember what is 18, you know, th three, three feet or something. There was, there was a, a, a statutory limit or uh, amount of space that had to be cleared for the firefighters. He said, let me help you bring just create that that legal, that the space that we need for you. For, so in case we need to help you, we can get in. And you know, and then the city won't come and try to clean your house out. And he said that really helped. I mean, it doesn't solve you know the the larger problem for the for the person necessarily, but it's a start, and it, it makes them feel like like interventions are meant to help them and not not be scary and and take away their agency and their their personhood. So I thought that was I I, I think that kind of approach has really taken hold more. Um, we probably need to see more of that. Just calling it heavy contents. You yeah. Know? It? Yeah. Oh yes. Um, well, first of all, I want to say I love professional organizers. You, <laughs> you. They, I, I mean, I, I, I talked to a lot of lovely people for the book. The organizers were so generous with their time, and I came away really admiring how much they care about the people they work with. You know, at least all the ones I talked to were really caring people who ended up being. I mean. As you know, a lot of it is is sort of the, 
kind of de facto therapy, you know, trying to get somebody um, through a really difficult process. Now, in my case, I, w I was grieving my mother, but before she died, um, she died last year in June uh, after s almost seven years in an assisted living facility. But um, it really feels like she died in some uh, most significant ways when she had her crisis and could no longer live in her house. I think we really, my daughter might agree with that, that, that we really lost the essence of my mother um, then. And so there was the initial, you know, the, the shock, disbelief, outrage phase. And then I started, it's only really, I, I just finished going through the final boxes of family papers from my mother last summer, because there, there, were so, there was so much stuff. And that was really when I finally started to feel like I was seeing her again beyond beyond all the things I'd had to deal with um, because I had cleared away you know given away just donated recycled every all the stuff that was inter that was sort of coming between me and her and I could see looking at her early letters and her paintbrushes and things I could sort of see her re-emerging and that has been um, so I can grieve uh, her more fully now and maybe maybe more kindly if that makes sense um, yeah, it's a long process, and I think it will probably continue to unfold as grief, you know, grief takes so many uh, erratic courses. Um, so, but anyway, thank you for what you do. <laughs> Question is, have you found any treasures that has made what you've gone through more bearable? Yeah, I found some fascinating things. Um, so I will say my parents had a terrible marriage, but a very romantic beginning, which was on crossing the North Atlantic in the 1950s my, on, the, on the Cunard line, the, the Queen Elizabeth, I think. And um, they met, by, my, my father says, oh, it was moonlight over the North Atlantic. How could I not fall in love? It's like, yeah, but it wasn't a good match. Anyway, but... <laughs> But I'm here, so I'm glad they. Um, he's he's still alive, and and, and uh, but he was long out of uh, out of the relationships. Uh, anyway, but when I went, going through my mother's stuff, I found some of these lovely, um, like menu cards from from that voyage, and like uh, little print, print printouts for the not printouts. Um, basically the day's events, you know, shuffleboard on the Lido deck, or we'll be showing this movie at four. And, and they're beautiful pieces of design because it was the 1950s and it was Cunard and the, you know, the, the colors are lovely, the, the font's lovely. And it just kind of gave me this, oh, wow, this, if, I, if you were crossing, if you were crossing, you know, on a boat like that, then this is, this would be your day. And, uh, and they weren't traveling um, she was, you know, going to, uh, for her junior year abroad, and he was going to study in England. But they were not traveling first class. But everybody had this, you know. And I found a luggage tag with the sort of the design of the ship on it, and those were really. I kept those things. Those are really neat, just little tangible souvenirs um, of of an important phase in their lives and in my life. Because I wouldn't be here if they hadn't, you know, without that moonlight over the North Atlantic. <laughs> yeah. Question about the anger and how you processed it, um, if you still have it, and uh, if you've seen it in other people. Um, it, uh, I am le a lot less angry than I was then. Writing the, going through the process of the clean out and then writing the book were both very cathartic and therapeutic. Um, it has come to see some of the, some of this, the factors that my mother was dealing with. I don't blame her as much as I probably did then. I think it was really important to me to be able to acknowledge that I was very angry and that because that's not sort of the good daughter thing or good child thing. Um, my mother and I were, were close in some ways, but very different people and, and had some rocky, you know, it wasn't always the easiest relationship. Um, and I think I, so I, I was kind of maybe kind of familiar already with not having a sort of idyllic parent-child relationship, although she was a great mother in many ways. Um, but being able to express to myself that it really felt like it, like she had sort of betrayed me in a way, partly by collapsing, but then having, um, she must have known, I mean, I'm an only child, you know, my stepfather had been dead since 2012, but she knew that someone was gonna have to deal with this stuff and she must have known it, would, it was gonna be me. I don't think she, I doubt she thought that, I don't think anyone thought that it would, that her final years would play out the way they did. So she probably thought she had more time and that she'd get around to it. Um, or maybe she just didn't think about it, but um, yeah. So it's me. The anger I can still access the anger if I think about it, but it's been superseded by 
more understanding and maybe the memory, some of the memories of the good things about her and understanding that a lot of people end up getting trapped in this kind of situation, partly through things they do or don't do and partly through other factors. Um, I will say it has, it has galvanized me. I, I've, did, I've have sworn I'm not going to do to my children. You're not going to hand my children the mess that was handed to me. And I think I'm on track for that. So <laughs> good. <laughs> and I so and I and I've tried to if any of you have a situation that you think might be brewing like the one I found myself in, if you are a parent or a child or a relative or a friend who might have to, anyway, have those conversations sooner um, and just sort of try to get clear on what people want and what's, are, are there meaningful things that, that you might be asked to find homes for that you would want? You know, um, we, we, I think I lost a lot of family history because by the time I was looking at these things closely, my mother was not able to tell me about them. So, and I, that, that, I, I grieve that too, as much as I grieve my mother in some ways. Um, yeah. So oh, do you want to, if you could have done it five years earlier, hypothetically, how would you have approached it? Especially now after you've done the research. Um, Boy, well, I mean, ideally, if it had been at all possible to get my mother involved while well, she still could be involved in, in f understanding what that these things were going to probably have to go somewhere, I mean, w that was never going to happen. So that um, both for her personality and just just the circumstances, I, I think I would have. Um, gosh, so it's such an interesting question. Uh, up front, probably giving myself permission to let some things go and not feel guilty and that not everything has to be sacredly, you know, it's not just because it belonged to your parent doesn't mean you should be, you should martyr yourself to the, the accumulated burden. Um, that's not fair to, for anyone to ask of you. Um, knowing that there are resources out there that might be able to help, uh, whether it's an estate sale company, a personal organizer, um, a social services agency, uh, elder care specialists. Uh, there's so many different resources depending on the circumstances and, and they don't all cost a lot of money. You know, you, you can, um, just knowing that you, there are people you can turn to, you don't have to be alone. That's, I think I would have felt comforted sooner if I'd, if I'd known where I could turn for advice and, and help. And I found those people along the way, but it would have been nice to go into, to go into the process knowing more about my options. But you think your mother, you never could have got your mother on board with. No, she she was so fiercely independent, um, and she never she always you know she did everything herself. She hung wallpaper, she painted. I mean, she was just one of those people who did not like to outsource anything. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I th and that stubbornness served her well for a long time, and then didn't serve her well. So, for a number of years, as we saw things were starting to get not so good for her. You know, like the, there was an IKEA desk that sat in her living room for ten years, unassembled. And every two years, one of my husband and I would say, "Do you want us to like put that together for you, or take it to Goodwill?" And she's like, "No, no, no, I'll, I'm going to get around to it." So she just would not. The the the, the you know the portcullis just came down right away, and she would just um, pull up the drawbridge, and those you, those conversations did not go anywhere. So, um, and I, I understand it's hard. You know, it's it's hard to to see that you might not be able to manage the way you used to be, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's hard for those around you too. <laughs> yeah. 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 Question is on gifting and how our culture encourages us to continue to show our love by gifting things that we have to hold on to and that we don't want. What do we do with that? What, well, it, I think calling attention, identifying it as, a, as an issue and as a, as a pattern and a set of expectations is a great starting point because once you see what's happening, you can start to move away from it. Um, my, uh, my dad is going to turn 90 this year, and the thing he loves most in the world now is to get photo books from family trips. He doesn't want stuff. He doesn't want sweaters. He doesn't want. We do give him the same, a pair of wallabies every year because he wears them out every year. So I think that's fair. Um, but he does not want stuff. He wants he wants the book that he can with the photos of the grandchildren. And every year, even if it's just the beach or some you know low key trip, there, there's there are enough photos, and he loves those. And it's it is a stack of stuff. But it, he looks at those like probably most at least once or twice a week. Visitors come and look at them. So we've kind of. With his help, actually, it's reoriented from big presents under the tree to this is what dad gets for um, for for Christmas. 
Um, my mother in her, when, when in the assisted living facility, she loved sweets. She didn't want, she didn't really care about clothes anymore or, other, or nice things like that. She loved coffee. She loved sweets. And she, nothing made her th more thrilled than a chocolate, good chocolate chip cookie or a brownie. And she'd say, Ooh, is that for me? And then she would kind of forget that we brought it to her. She was like, Ooh, is that for me? And, <laughs> And it, once we get past, like, a, she also had vascular dementia, so that dying by inches thing is really um, an, a, an apt description. But it was almost sort of charming in a way that she was so she was so in the moment and loved loved these very small things so much, you know. Um, yeah, I don't. Know. There are there are ways you can sort of, especially if you're able to talk to your loved ones about this a bit and say, do you really want another pair of pajamas for Christmas, or you know, maybe we could get tickets to a play or I could take you out to dinner or have an experience. You know, there are some ways to show love that don't involve accumulating the same kinds of stuff over and over again. I have a friend who who gave us a tree when a grandson was born. Oh. A lot better than Oh, that's great. You know, a big stuffy maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um you have a quote that you use and an author a number of times in the book, and I just wanted to kind of go to that quote. Um, it's William Morris, where he says, "How have nothing in your house that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. And that was from William Morris from a, the Beauty of Life lecture given at Birmingham Society of Arts and School of Design in 1880. <laughs> so, how has your interpretation of that quote through this process, has it changed or how have you applied it to yourself? That, that's, that's probably still my yardstick. I guess he's anticipated Marie Kondo in some ways, but that, it's, a good, it's not a bad standard because you get to decide what's useful to you or what's beautiful to you. Um, the, not some, and, and so, which means it's a flexible standard. And um, no, it, I think it's, it continues to be meaningful to me, and I still have it over my desk. Just, I just the first time I came across it, I thought that really makes sense, and then it became kind of a, a guiding principle as I was thinking about this um, this topic. And he is a Victorian, but he has you know he was not one of the excessive ones. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, do you want to leave us with anything else? Or are you working on a? a a second? A, a sequel? Uh, well, I hope not a sequel. Um, I'm actually thinking about the other side of the question, which is what we save, not what we accumulate, but what we choose to save, what we preserve, how we preserve it. And these are, I haven't, the idea hasn't fully gelled yet, but I'm really interested in more in that side of the question, uh, because I think there's a lot there, particularly now as we're moving into the digital, we are in the digital age and a lot of what we save it looks different. Um, I'm thinking a lot recently about, uh, as I go through family photos, thinking about how my kids, all their photos are on their phones or, you know, on, um, and what is it going to look like? What, what will a clean out look like, you know, 50 years from now? Um, so I think there's something there, but, um, but I haven't quite nailed it down yet. Well, there's an opportunity for folks to take and save a copy of your book over here, <laughs> and she'll be here with us to sign the book afterwards. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all of your questions and your comments and sharing. Thanks to Palefire for hosting us and WMRA. And next month, we'll be back in February. We're actually coming together on February 14th doesn't happen every year, but a Valentine's Day experience. And we're going to be talking about death um, with. <laughs> yeah. I know. We, we did the last time we did monster portraits with Sophia Samatar, if you remember that. So we kind of go a different way on February 14th. Um, it's after a doctor explores what near death experiences reveal about life and beyond by Bruce Grayson. He's a doctor in Charlottesville. So join us. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all very much.